So then, of course, you went on and went on. You could do whatever you wanted. I mean, you were king of the network. It had to be a pretty good feeling. Uh, I could do anything. And uh, the arrogance of power took over. And, you know, I'm cocky now, but uh, 40 years ago with a 50 share, forget about it. <laughs> and that's when we sold Turn On, which was uh, an adventure. And Turn On was actually, one day I'm going to run Turn On. It was actually a hell of a television show. Um, it all happened inside a white ball with shadowless light, which gave us an infinity. So we could put one guy here and a guy here without diopters, and they looked like they were standing right beside each other. And uh, the whole idea was to arrest the viewer's attention uh, without really having them comfortable in a place. They were just there. And then uh, we didn't have an audience. The whole show was programmed in a computer, which people didn't understand. And all of these images came out of a computer. And there was no audience. The audience reaction was all done in a device that was brand new called the Moog Synthesizer. Well, today, every record you hear is done with the synthesizer. But at that point, nobody had heard it yet. So it was a new f fabricated sound, invented sound. And those were the audience reactions. And uh, instead of the normal applause and laughter. And uh, we were doing multiple images at a time you couldn't do multiple images because there was no way to do it electronically. So we took four film projectors and put them on mirrors and then you could see these four images on there. And uh, um, I remember the network would go crazy on both laugh in and on turn on. They'd say, well, you can't look at more than one thing at a time, which I find amusing now when you realize that the amount of images that are on a screen at one time and uh, the audience has gotten accustomed to it. But at that point, uh, the network was very uncomfortable with having more than one thing on the screen at a time. And, uh, but it went on, and it was we, the original commitment was for 13 shows, and we sold it to Bristol Myers, who were a very, very conservative sponsor. And when they saw the pilot, with Tim Conway in the pilot trying to commit suicide all through the show, uh, they increased the purchase from 13 to 16. And uh, it went on the air, and there was a guy in Cleveland. Nobody ever heard this. There was a guy in Cleveland who wanted ABC to keep Peyton Place on the air. He hated the idea of losing Peyton Place. And uh, so he got on the phone. He had never seen the show. But he got on the phone and called all of the affiliates and said, this is terrible, we have to get rid of it, it's going to ruin your station and my station. And he started calling them, and he called the East Coast, and then he kept calling them and calling them. So they kept canceling the show before anybody had seen it, because of this one wing nut in Cleveland, right, who I still say belongs in Silly City in a rubber room, you know. And uh, he was very effective, though. And the network said, we can't do this, because it'll, we'll lose the network. Nobody had seen the show. And it was just this one wacko in Cleveland. And he said, uh, the, they said that they had jammed the switchboard. And Tim Conway was there about six months later. The switchboard was one phone <laughs> with two lines on it and a girl sitting there with terminal acne and the IQ of a chrysanthemum. And she was trying to answer the phone while she was still talking to whatever served as a boyfriend. She was the one that said the switchboard was jammed. It was two lines. In Cleveland, that was right around when the, the the river caught on fire in Cleveland. You know, this was not uh, this was not Harvard, so anyhow, but it was very effective. And they called, and they and the network. My deal with the network was that they wouldn't pay me anything unless I agreed to never air the shows. Because if you ever saw the shows, they're brilliant. They're really great. We had a lady, one girl, had a vending machine, and she put a quarter in, and you pan down, and it said the pill. And she started, she went crazy. It wouldn't come out of the vending machine. And she went nuts screaming. That. They thought, well, this is a woman. This is a sexually aggressive woman. I said, yeah, yeah, that happens, you know. Where do you think all of these babies come from? Right? But they resented that there was a sexually aggressive woman going crazy when she couldn't get a pill out of the vending machine. And then we had the Pope there, and the Pope would say, peace, baby. And it was pretty 
It was pretty hip. It would even be hip by today's standards. Uh, one day I'm going to put it all together and, and put it on the air as the truth about Turn On. That was Digby Wolf again. You know, we, we got all of the kids from UCLA who were film students, <clears throat> and we gave them cameras and film to go out and shoot whatever they wanted. And uh, some of those kids became really serious cinematographers and producers. Uh, but they would do just funny films. One thing was we had uh, a little animated character come out and uh, and he threw a rock. And the guy on this side, another little character, came out and he threw a bigger rock. Then this character came out and he threw a spear. And this character came out and he threw a big spear. This one came out with a bow and arrow. This one came out with a, a, a crossbow. And they kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger until finally this one came out and threw a bomb and it was the atomic bomb. And then everything was quiet, and then this guy came out and threw a rock again, right? <laughs> and they, and uh, <laughs> they thought it was a bit too strong an anti-war statement at the time of, uh, of uh, Vietnam. <laughs>